ಶ್ರೇಷ್ಠಮನುಮಾಪುತ್ರೂಪ ತಸ್ಯಾಗ್ರಜಮುರೂಪುರಿಮಾತಿಂಗೋಷ್ಠಾವತಿ ರಾಧಾಕುಂದಿ ಪರಮಹೋ ರಾಧಿಕಮಾಧಾವಸ್ಯಪ್ರತೀತ್ರೀಪಾಯಗುರು ತಂ ನೋಸ್ಮಿ ವಂಚಕಲ್ಪತರೂಭ್ಯ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧೂಭ್ಯೇಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣಿಲಾಶ್ರತೆ ಮೌಲ್ಯ ರಾತ್ನಮಾಲಿ ಕರುಣಾವತೀರ್ಣಲೋ ಸಮರ್ಪಯಿತ ಮಂ ನೋಜ್ವಲಾಸ್ರಿಯ ಹರಿಪುರತ ಸುಂದರಾದ್ಯುತಿ ಕದಂಬ ಸಂದೀಪಿ ಸದಾ ಲಂಬಿತಕ್ಷಂಬರೋಧಿಜಾವರೋ ಜುಗಧಾರ್ಮಪಾಲೋ ವಂದೇ ಜಗತ್ ಪ್ರಿಯಕರೋಕರುಣಾವತಾರಕ್ತಿಪ್ರಾಧನಾಧರನಮಸ್ತೆ ಹೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರುಣ ಸಿಂಧೋ ದೀನ ಬಂಧೋ ಜಗತ್ಪತೆ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗುಪೀಕಾ ಕಂತ ರಾಧಾ ಕಂತ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ರಾಧೆ ಬೃಂದವನಾಧೀಶೆ ಕರುಣಮೃತವಾಹಿ ಕೃಪಯ ನಿಜ ಪಾದ್ಯಾನ್ಮ್ಯಂ ಪ್ರದೀಯತ ಭಕ್ತಿಹೀನಾಪರಾಧಲಕ್ಷಿತ್ತಕಮಿತರಂಗಮಾಧ್ಯೆ ಕೃಪಾಮಯಿ ಶಾರಣ ಪ್ರಪನ ವೃಂದೇನ್ಮಸ್ತೆ ಚರನಾರವಿಂದ ವೃಂದೇನ್ಮಸ್ತೆ ಚರನಾರವಿಂದ ಶ್ರೀಲ ಗುರುದೇವ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀಮನ್ ಮಹಾಪ್ರು ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಹರಿನಾಮ ಸಂಕೀರ್ತನ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ಗೌರ್ ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ಗೌರ್ ಗದಾಧರ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಬಲರಾಮ್ ಜಿ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ರಾಧ ಮಾಧವ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ತಿರುಬಾಬ್ ಮಹೋತ್ಸವ ತಿತ್ತಿ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಹೃದಯ ಬೋನ್ ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಗೌರ್ ಭಕ್ತ ಬೃಂದ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಗೌರ್ ಪ್ರಮಾಣ ಪ್ರಣಾಮ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಸೋ ಮಚ್ ಫಾರ್ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಅಗೇನ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಕ್ಯೂಸ್ ಮಿ ಫಾರ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕರೇಂಜಿಂಗ್ ಯು ಐ ನೋ ಮನಿ ಯು ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಗುರು ಮಹಾರಾಜ್ ಬೀನ್ ಸಿತ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಐ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ಹಾರಿಕಥಾ ಬಟ್ ಹಿ ಪ್ರಿಫರ್ ಟು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟೇಕ್ ಸಮ್ ಲಿಟಲ್ ರೆಸ್ಟ್ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ಟುಡೇಸ್ ಟುಡೇ ವಾಸ್ ಪ್ರಿಟಿ ಮಚ್ dynamic for him and he wanted to be as healthy as possible for tomorrow's days which is an important and intense day as well for all so so he requested me if i could try to 
to, to share something today, so we will continue, with your permission, with the next verse of Sri Brahma Stuti, if you will. We have it here as well. Um, verse 27 today, but as usual, I'll make a brief recap of what we saw yesterday, 20, verse 26. I will briefly read the verse in English, and then we will go to some words about it. So Brahma said yesterday, the conception of material bondage and the conception of liberation are both manifestations of ignorance. The soul is real, transcendental, and its consciousness is constant. When the soul is being considered, the states of bondage and liberation do not exist apart from it. Just like from the perspective of the sun, there is neither night nor day. So yes, this is was this was yesterday's verse, in which Brahma tried to make this point that from the perspective of the Atma, if we consider the intrinsic nature of the soul, there cannot be ignorance in the very constitution of who we are, in the very constitution of the jiva. Because if that happened, that would be a problem because that's part of our swarup. That's part of our swarup. It will always be there, so we will never be. Uh, beyond it, if you will. So matter and spirit are, as Srila Prabhupada will say many times, like oil and water. You can put them in the same container. It seems they are mixing, but one is not touching the other, technically speaking. So in that sense, Brahma is making the point, since bondage cannot be an actual reality in the jiva, there also mukti cannot be, because mukti means deliverance from bondage, technically speaking. So mukti is the counterpart of bondage. Liberation is the counterpart of bada, of being bad, of being bond. In the example is, of course, pretty clear. If you're in the sun, there's no night in the sun, and therefore there is no day. We speak of day as something that is different from night. But if every single day is day, probably you won't, you won't call it, oh, now is day, because it's always the same. So from the perspective of the sun, there's no day, no day nor night. From the perspective of the Atma, there's no bondage, no liberation. In other words, the, the constitution of the jiva is to be liberated, in the sense to be untouched by matter. In its very intrinsic constitution, it's free from matter. Again, serious, everyone. We need another joke, Rupa. <laughs> So the point is, as we mentioned, when we speak of liberation, because of course we even say, but Maharaj, for the last 20 years, I've heard the, the term liberation, 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 liberation. So the idea is, or enlightenment means basically that such liberated state of the jiva becomes brought to light. It's brought to light. So as we say yesterday, bondage is the absence of awareness of the jiva's beginningless liberated state. That's basically what we call bond. To not be aware. And to think otherwise. And how does this happen? How we are thinking so to happen? Due to the influence of Maya Shakti, which is particularly interesting and achintya in its own, because Maya Shakti is in one sense categorically inferior to the Tathasta Shakti. Tathasta Shakti is conscious, and matter, maya shakti is inert, but somehow the conscious substance ourselves become distracted or unaware of their own nature by the influence of maya shakti. We gave the example of someone looking at a video recorded by someone real, and real moment, real video, and you feel certain emotions watching the video, while actually none of those things are actually happening to you, but you become engrossed in that particular perspective. Our acharyas also mentioned that basically the real purpose of this particular point in this verse is for Brahma to downplay the idea of mukti altogether. Like saying mukti is actually a counterpart of bondage, both of them are illusory, like doing away with mukti as a purusharta or as a goal to attain, because he's, he's pointing here at the goal of bhakti, sudha bhakti, which as Burma said today, mama janmani janmani shwari bhavaktat bhakti in Sudha Bhakti, we do, not, we do not care for liberation. That means you are beyond liberation. Of course, you can, it's easier said than done, but the ideal 
includes that, that proposal that Brahma is having this, as we mentioned the other day, this ideal personified in the form of the Brajavasis, all these unique personalities mm, that seem to be bound to material existence, that seem to be part of samsara. They themselves feel we are part of samsara. They are asking Krishna, which will be our next birth. They are not dreaming we will get liberated or moksha. And they are not interested in that. That's the most interesting thing. <laughs> they are so much beyond liberation that they do not care for liberation and that they consider themselves bond. But they are way beyond that. So Brahma is realizing all this in this precise moment. Mm -hmm. So we basically mentioned this yesterday, also mentioning these two notions of vidya and abidya as potencies of maya shakti, while there is another vidya with capital B, which has to do with the vidya shakti of the swarup shakti, also called sometimes sandhini shakti, which is an aspect of bhakti which will upgrade our potential to its maximum reach mm -hmm. and not only showing who we are beyond the unawareness of who we are <laughs> as jivas, as tatasta shakti, but all that we can be in terms of our prospect and potential under the shelter of bhakti. Mm -hmm. So today we, we will see verse 27, yeah, 27, which will be the penultimate verse, not of the whole Brahma Stuti, but of a section of the Brahma Stuti in which Brahma is making certain points. This will be the penultimate of those verses. And Brahma basically in this verse will continue criticizing or condemning, as you want to put it, <laughs> those who do not consider Krishna as the ultimate being. Of course, as we mentioned before, he himself was part of that group a few minutes ago. <laughs> so the verse seems that Brahma is quite fired up about smashing on Mayabad, smashing on, on this and that. But in one sense, he himself is feeling, I was part of that group a few minutes ago, considering Krishna as an imposter and, and his friends as ordinary people and his picnic as ordinary activity, ordinary, ordinary, ordinary. And now I'm realizing this is beyond Vaikuntha. So try to imagine the, the conversion that Brahma is going through in these last few minutes. That's a real conversion that he's experiencing here. So let's go to verse 27. I'll read it first, and then we can read it all together. This will be in Anushtub, which is one very, maybe the most classical, well-known meter, Chanda in Sanskrit shlokas, very much found in, in the Bhagavad Gita, among other texts. So it says like this. Tvamatmanam paramatva paramatmanam evacha atmapunar bahir mrigya ahokya janata nyata Tvamatmanam paramatva paramatmanam evacha ahokya janata nyata Okay, so let's go to the this English translation of the verse. Brahma is saying, How astounding is the ignorance of ignorant people <laughs> who consider you, who are their very self, to be some separated manifestation of illusion and who consider the self to be something else, the material body, and who therefore conclude that the self is to be searched outside of your Supreme Personality. So basically that's today's verse in which Brahma is again expressing chamatkar, as we will see, expressing astonishment in connection to the ignorance of the ignorant. And remember, he's not trying to not take responsibility from his own recent mischief, but he's beginning at home. No. <laughs> he's, one, he's like wondering about how much potential we have in the direction of Abhidya, no? which of course is an indirect way of saying how much potential we have in the most brilliant possible horizon. Mm? So this idea is very interesting. Sometimes one way of realizing how much bright potential we have in connection to Bhakti, to indirectly realize that is to realize how much potential we have to go deep into the darkness of illusion. How much 
you can reach newer and newer layers and it has no end. And you have a great, we have great talent, great potential to discover newer, upgrade our no? <laughs> falling condition, if you will. So that indirectly saying, if you just use, use this potential in upwards, I mean, you can imagine which is the bright future that is waiting for you. And that's, of course, the whole idea. There's a place for, for examining how much potential we go. We have to go in the wrong direction, but not to get over-identified with that, not to get depressed, not to get discouraged, but just to realize, wow, if I have this talent to become that much degraded, I mean, what if I use this same hyper-powerful energy <laughs> to make a new Guinness record, but in the upwards direction, <laughs> especially with the assistance of Sadhu Sangha Bhakti. I mean, th that's the idea, basically, not to get stuck there and how, how fallen we are, how deeper we can go and in the wrong sense of the term. I mean, that's another way of becoming distracted and remaining in the ego platform. Me, 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 I'm so fallen, I'm so fallen. I can be more fallen and I can be the most fallen. As this devotee once said to Srila Prabhupada, not Srila Prabhupada, are your most fallen disciple. And Prabhupada said, you are not the most anything. No. <laughs> because he felt you want to be the most something. So if you're going to be the most excellent devotee, at least let me be the most fallen. But I want the most title in something, some labeling on that. <laughs> so, so that's an interesting meditation. Mm -hmm. When we analyze how extremely degraded or envious or whatever darkness manifestation you want to, to, to express, that's not the end of the story. That's just indirectly showing you how bright potential you have if you will direct all that energy and thoughts and emotions in the proper direction. And that's why Srila Siddha Maharaj will say, your future is brilliant. And that's one of my favorite quotes from him. Your four, four words, very simple. He had many more elaborate statements, but this is very profound and coming from someone like him. I mean, we have to believe him because they are, when they say they mean it, if they say to you, your future is brilliant, it means they are seeing that. They are seeing your, that your future is brilliant. They are just, they are not paying lip service to the idea. Your future is brilliant. means I am seeing that brightness. And through all the darkness that you are maybe seeing now, I'm seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. And, and that's you, basically. You are the one at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> You are not the tunnel. <laughs> Even though you may say, no, I'm the tunnel, I'm in the tunnel, I don't know. You're the light at the end of the tunnel. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. Look in that direction. <laughs> and that's you. I become identified with your prospect, with all that you can be. And that's that's our hope. And that's the, the generous glance of the sadhu, as, as Guru Mahesh always say. They are not judging us according to what we did in the past. Whew. Huh? They are not judging us according to what we are in the present. <laughs> Double. <laughs> I need more of this, sorry. No. Okay. But they are judging, or not judging, but considering us according to all that we can be in the future. That's it. The, 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 the warmth, the warm glance of Mahaprabhu and the Sadhus. No. But, and you may say, but I'm this, and I'm so fallen, and I did this, and I did that. But the Department of Costless Mercy will say, stop that prajalpa, stop that nonsense. You have a bright future, bright potential, and we want to take you there. So if you, in the name of humility, resist that, in the name of I'm so fallen, that's not humility. <laughs> if you follow. Real humility means I don't care how fallen I am. The Department of Mercy is way more powerful, as we always say, that all my anarchists put together. Don't think that all your nartas put together is the great thing. It's nothing. <laughs> it's a joke in comparison to the grace of Mahaprabhu and Guru Parampara. So, how astonishing is the ignorance of ignorant people? Brahma is surprising at that. Again, indirectly by appreciating that, again, this is not to condemn how astonishing you can, how can you be. How can you be so ignorant, so ignorant, so fallen? It's not in that, in that sense. But but it's good to express this type of sensitive sensibilities, chamatkar, or to get surprised how 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 much reach you have in the in the direction of darkness, and therefore always play the indirect meaning of that. How bright is your perspective? 
But in this case, Brahma is con concentrating in this direction. And who are those people who are ignorant, those who are considering Krishna as an aspect of illusion, those who are considering themselves of something different from who they are, identifying with the body, and who therefore conclude that the self, and ultimately the self with capital letter, Krishna, is to be searched outside of Krishna. Ram is saying that to Krishna. He has Krishna in front. Remember this. Try to remember, keep in mind the context of the prayer. He's saying all this with Krishna here after all that happened a few minutes ago. So let's go to the word by word. I'll mention the word. You can repeat then and so on. Tuam you Atmanam the real self Param as another Matva thinking Param another Atmanam as the self Eva only Cha also Atma the Supreme Self Punaha again Bahi outside Mrigyaha must be searched out Aho oh Agnya Janata, the ignorant people. Agnyata, the ignorance. So let's share Bhaktivedanta Bhavanubhat, which is the elaboration this verse by our, our Guru Maharaj. This is a section that will be part of his forthcoming book, Sakya Mandal, where he will render very interesting commentary on the whole Brahma Studio. So another generous trailer that he's sharing with us in this poem. He says like this. With a sense of astonishment, Brahma exclaims here that those who have understood the difference between the Atma and Maya, which can be connected to previous verse, but at the same time think that Krishna is only an Atma like themselves, are utterly ignorant. They look only within their own Atma or, other than to Krishna, they look to his indeterminate feature, Nirvishesh Brahman, for enlightenment. Brahma says, such persons do not seek you, Krishna, outside of their finite selves as you appear in your Braja Lila, you who are the determinate absolute and support of Brahman. How astounding is the ignorance of those who consider themselves knowledgeable. So again, remember, all this is reflecting back on some level, at least to Brahma's own embarrassing mischief a few minutes ago. His, his own recent misreading of who Krishna was. But of course, as we will see, that will extend to other personalities, Vivartavadis and, and other followers of different schools. So according to Brahma's uh, recent experience, and again, sorry to insist with that, but that was it's a pretty significant epiphany that he had a few minutes ago. Remember, he thought Krishna is an unordinary guy and an impostor under the guise of my guru. And after a few minutes, he realized he is the source of Narayan. <laughs> so try to imagine there's some the shift between one idea and the other. Now you are an impostor, you're the source of God. Okay. <laughs> I think I made some mistake in between. So, interestingly, Brahma, uh, what's Abhidya for Brahma in this verse? No, of course, on one level, he says to ignore the Atma is Abhidya, is ignorance, to not know who you are as an Atma. But not only to know the Atma, but he says also to only know the Atma is a form of Abhidya. No? To not know yourself as an Atma, that's Abhidya. To know yourself as Atma only, that's also a Vidya. Well, according to what he's experiencing now, well, to know you as an Atma in comparison to have Raja Krishna in front of you 
that's still a bit yeah. <laughs> there's so much left to to discover hmm? or he says or oh, to consider krishna anatma to consider krishna one more soul if you will he he did that a few minutes ago that's a vidya hmm? or he says to think of the absolute mainly in terms of nirvishesh or devoid of qualities that's a vidya hmm? to not conceive the full-fledged presentation of the determinate absolute, as Guru Maharaj will put here, not indeterminate absolute. So all these different possibilities are abhidya, Brahma is saying. To not know the Atma, to only know the Atma, to think Krishna is an, a mere Atma, or to think the absolute is merely Brahman. All that is abhidya. In contrast with, and he mentioned this point here, instead of looking for you, Imraj, as the commentators will make clear, as Brahma, as Krishna. That's not a vidya. For, this is a standard of Brahma. Now, what's not a vidya? He means Krishna and Braj. That's not a vidya. <laughs> it sounds a little bit like fanatic, but <laughs> he's awakening to this new reality. So he will say, everything apart from Braj and Krishna is a vidya. <laughs> no? So there's place for this type of emotional expressions in, in, in different in different sections of Shastra coming from the hearts of realized devotees, the Guru Maharaj likes to quote Prabodhananda Saraswati, if you read Chaitanya Chandramrita or any of his books, I mean, the other day I was speaking with one devotee and we were laughing and agreeing with that. We were speaking about Prabodhananda Saraswati and he would tell me, he's a fanatical <laughs> in the proper sense of the term, no, not criticizing him. And I say, I totally agree with you. In, in which sense, he will say things like, now that, um, where Guru Maharaj will quote this, now that Mahaprabhu has came to the world, who cares for Baraha? Who cares for Nishimha Dev? What they did? Okay, but it's nothing in comparison to my gore. And he starts to glorify Mahaprabhu. No. <laughs> of course, if you are not Prabodhananda Saraswati and, does, and do copy-paste of this prayer, you engage in Avatar Aparat. <laughs> so be careful not to... He's fanatical in a transcendental way. You can be fanatical, maybe we can be fanatical in another day. But there are many of these statements. And so somehow Brahma here is, we will see how his prayers are becoming more and more emotional. In a few verses, he will start to praise the Brajabasis, Vrindavan, pray to be born as anything and anywhere in Vrindavan, and glorify the, say, aho again, but in another direction, in the direction of the Brajabas and Gopas in particular. So He's awakening, if you will, to this, to his deity and to his prospect in connection to his deity. And he's saying things like this. Apart from you, everything is a bidya, something like that. <laughs> but he's walking the talk. He's having insight of that, epiphany of that. And again, he's expressing chamatkar at this level in relation to those that basically do not know what real knowledge is, but consider themselves knowledgeable. That's the most like striking thing. Because one thing is you are in full abhidya, and at least you recognize, I don't know, I'm in ignorance, I don't have a clue about this. But if you on the contrary think, I know everything that has to be known, and you don't have a clue about what you have to know, that Brown says, Oh, oh, oh means like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I added the last two words there, no? just contemporary version of the Aho. Oh. Aho oh, means oh, well, expressing chamatkar, surprise. Hmm? And he will himself, again, he's not avoiding re taking responsibility in this. He will say that in a few verses also. He says at the end of his praise, he will say, Those who say, I know about Krishna, no, thank you, Rama says. I'll, I'll offer my pranam from the other side of the street. Those who say, I know something or I know everything about Krishna. Like implying, I was one of them five minutes ago. And I'm, I'm realizing how far I am from that and how impossible it is to know everything about Krishna. As we said the other day, even Krishna does not know everything about Krishna. He himself is, as we will say today, in the interesting mathematics of <laughs> Eternity, he's be becoming more beautiful. His ananda is increasing. He's changing in that in the on the foundation of 
immutability. Okay. Sorry, I'm practicing my English with all of you. <laughs> I need to do some that with someone. At the same time, there is unfolding. There is development on the, regarding the potential of this Sarup Shakti. We have potential as Tatasta, but Sarup Shakti also has potentials. <laughs> so, so anyhow, Brahma is expressing that type of surprise, Chamatkar. You know, how that people who ignore Krishna dare to think I know everything or I know even something. <laughs> Oh, and I was one of them, and I still am one of them. But but still, at least at least I'm starting to realize how little I know. That's real wisdom, as Socrates will say. You know? I only know that I don't know. To really walk that talk, that means, and he knew pretty much many things. <laughs> okay, let's continue with some of our commentaries. Tikas ancient. Uh, renderings and revelation from our Purvacharyas. Let's begin with Sridhar Swami and his Bhavartha Deepika. Hmm? He says, Brahma speaks with a sense of astonishment, aho, as though he were rebuking people, as though, but it's not, while only meaning to express the following. Hmm? He's, he paraphrases Brahma here. By thinking of you, the Atma, and remember Atma is also one name for Krishna, so he's referring here to Atma with capital A, to Krishna. So by thinking of you, the Atma, as someone who has a body and a mind, in other words, by wrongly superimposing a body and a mind unto you, and by thinking of the self as the body and the mind, that is, by wrongly superimposing their sense of identity unto the body and the mind, People suppose that the Atma is to be found in the external world. So by misreading who you are and who they are, they start the search in the wrong direction. It is quite, Sridhar Swami concludes saying, it is quite amazing that, that the Atma, the true understanding of which is sabotaged in this way, should be sought outside. Indeed, when something becomes destroyed in one house, one does not go to the forest to search for it. <laughs> so he's making that point regarding to those who are, sometimes the term is used, bahir mukha, no? so with their face towards, external faced towards, I don't know how to translate that. <laughs> those whose attention is in the externals. So it's interesting because we will see how the commentators will use this idea of look outside, as something that is criticized or as something that will be praised, but from different perspectives. <laughs> so here, Sridhar Swami is referring to, to conditioned beings who are looking for considering Krishna as a body and a mind and considering themselves as mere body and mind without seeing Atma, with small a or with capital A, if we are speaking about Krishna. And instead, instead of looking the Atma, they're looking in the outside direction, which is basically what a conditioned soul is doing. They are looking for the Atma because you, can, you, are, you cannot look for anything else. Actually, The only thing you are looking for are those things that pertain to the Atma, whether Atma or Atma with capital A. <laughs> but you misread reality and you run after hmm, the object of this world, basically. And you think as we spoke some class ago, we think we derive pleasure from the sense objects while actually we are projecting our, investing our own self in those objects and thinking, oh, this is giving me so much pleasure. But actually, <laughs> your investment in that particular object is what is allowing you to experience that, not the object in itself, which is... Oh. <laughs> Inert matter. <laughs> Make a nice sound, but... <laughs> Knowing her, it's asad achit nirananda, as the Shastra says. No, it has no inherent bliss in it, and so on. And this extends to all the material sense objects, just in case, not just with this poor table here. It's rendering nice service. <laughs> Let's go to Srila Sanatan Goswami's um, Brihad Vaishnav Tosni commentary. He says. Even when the nature of Atma and the nature of the material world 
have been discerned in this way, again, in connection to the previous verse, when there is a clear idea, what's Maya Shakti, what's the, the reach, the area of influence, what's the Atma, and actually, even when those things are being properly discerned, those who think of you, the Atma of all Atmas, only as a Jiva, are false. So implying you may have a glimpse about, okay, Maya is not part of my constitution and all the things we spoke in the previous class. But if still they think of Krishna as an Atma without capital A, Brahma said, still, no, they're missing the point here. And Sanatan who concludes referring to the word Aho. So this connection Aho is an expression of astonishment. How astounding is the ignorance of the ignorant? That's basically Brahma's surprise in this connection. And again, as, as, as much as we should engage in that type of astonishment, that should be done uh, artfully, if you will. Because you can do that, for example, without compassion. And that's not the idea. That's what I am emphasizing. If you look at others or at yourself, wow, which capacity do I have or do we have to, to go down and down? That compassion should be included in the equation, considering... What if all that is taken in the proper direction, proper potential, and there is hope? So if you don't have that compassion, you just like go deeper and deeper and deeper, <laughs> lower and lower, not deeper, lower and lower. <laughs> mm -hmm. So here again, Brahma is expressing a form of chamatkar. As Shastra is saying, rasas are chamatkar. Mm -hmm. The essence of rasa is chamatkar. <laughs> but which Chamatkar no? and which Rasa? No? Of course, Srila, Srila Jeeva Goswami will say the only Rasa you can experience in, in this material world is Vibhatsa Rasa. No? <laughs> That's the only mellow, disgust, the mellow of disgust. So in that sense, you can speak about some Chamatkar also. But, and again, maybe we have to first go through this type of Aho if you want to get to another Aho. And Brahma, in a few verses, verse, I think, 32, he will say Aho again, but twice even. Aho Vagyam, Aho Vagyam, Nanda Gopa Brajokasam, Yan Mitram Paramanandam, Purnam Brahma Sanatan. If you want to invoke some smile in Guru Maharaj, you memorize this verse. You take him by surprise. He comes tomorrow and all of you, one, two, three, you recite all these verses. Be ready for it some charming expression from Guru Maharaj. That's for you to know if you want some information there. <laughs> if there is one favorite verse of him in the bottom, probably this, in the top five will be for sure. <laughs> so in this verse, Brahma will say, aho, aho, two times aho, but in this case, he's surprising, astonished at the great fortune of the Brajabhasis, especially the friends of Krishna, whom, who are, who are relating to the absolute in connection to to Guru Maharaj reply to the to Linya, uh, Krishna is Purna Brahma Sanatanam. He's the complete, absolute, eternal, great personality, but Jan Mitram. They are relating to him as a friend on equal terms. So who are they? What's their fortune? How oh, oh. Brahma's head starts to spin again. No? Another form of Bimohan. He's going from one Bimohan to another, actually. Every verse of the Brahma Stuti is an upgraded level of Bimohan. <laughs> no, it's another way of saying Chamatkar, if you will. <laughs> so it's not that the Bimohan stops when he starts praying. No, the more he prays, the more he starts to glimpse who actually Krishna is, who actually Brajavasis are. And now his, his Brahma's foreheads are spinning another way, no, in another direction, if you will. <laughs> But first, before saying aho bhagyam, aho bhagyam, he's saying aho here in relation to the ignorance of the ignorant. Mm -hmm. So probably we as sadhakas, and remember, Brahma is being an example for us as a progressive sadhaka on his way towards perfection, the satya. So probably we may have to pass through this first aho if we want to get to the, to the other aho. <laughs> If we want to say reach the double, aho, aho, bagyam, aho, bagyam. <laughs> First, we, we may have to see the aho in the other direction. Oh, wow, how, how much capacity do I have to do nonsense? 
and then I can indirectly understand what if I direct this in the other direction? In, how fortunate, how fortunate I am. Not only the Brajavasis. Of course, Brahma, when he's saying, how fortunate, how fortunate are these Brajavasis, indirectly he's saying, how fortunate, how fortunate I am. Because I've been blessed with the opportunity to enter into that domain. I mean, I'm feeling some attraction in that direction, and that's by mercy, because it's not by the strength of my previous mischief five minutes ago. <laughs> to how fortunate, how fortunate they are, I'm an extension of how fortunate I am to enter in contact with such, with such fortunate people. But before realizing all that, maybe we have to say, oh, how unfortunate, how unfortunate <laughs> I, I am. But how fortunate I can be by the grace of bhakti, something like that. Hmm. So there is no harm in becoming amazed at your own capacity for ignorance, basically. <laughs> <laughs> you have to reach those limits and you realize, okay, wow. I'm pretty skillful <laughs> in falling lower and lower into the embrace of Maya Shakti. So now, okay, I realize that. What, what, how can we upgrade that skill by the grace of God? That's the next question. <clears throat> Let's go to Srila Jiva Goswami's Lago Vaishnav Toshani. He paraphrases <clears throat> Brahma in the following way. Thinking of you, the Atma, with capital A, one who is not the Atma, with capital A, I'm thinking, sorry, thinking of you, the Atma, as one who is not the Atma, thinking of you as the Atma with capital A, the Supreme, as one who is not the Supreme, I'm thinking that something other than you is the Atma, the Supreme, I'm thinking that oh, this Krishna is as much some powerful being, because some people may think, maybe they may not say Krishna is ordinary guy, they may say, he's a powerful personality. He did some pretty extraordinary things. But the Atma, no, that's too much to say that he's the Supreme. Thinking like that, mm, uh, I'm probably thinking the Absolute is actually Nirvishesh Brahman. And Krishna is a powerful person, yes. Mm, therefore, they will say the Atma with A, long A, outside, implying what does it mean outside here, outside of the region of your lotus feet. That's what Jiva Goswami say. No, that people who misread who you are, they are looking the supreme outside. And outside, in this case, means not at your lotus feet. In other words, Brahma is saying, I'm starting to realize who you are and where, where my search should be conducted, in which direction. Remember, Brahma is like the very epitome, if you will, of the searcher, of the inquiry, in one sense. And from the very beginning, the genesis of creation appearing in the lotus and started to go down the how do you say the stem looking for his source and looking and looking pretty hard returning in tapa engaging in meditation looking 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 so and now he's realizing all that journey all that trajectory that began eons and eons ago <laughs> are is converging in those two in another stem, no, in the stem of your lotus feet. So, I was born in a lotus. I was looking in the lotus stem. I didn't find that. I'm finding two lotuses now, and I have to enter into those that stems and look for all everything else there. <laughs> so that's one meaning that Jiva Goswami gives. Then he says, or, and then comes another possibility, or thinking that you are the pure form of the Jiva, or thinking of you only as Antaryami or Paramatma, they do not search for they do not search for you externally. And what does it mean externally, Jiva Goswami says? In Vrindavan. <laughs> so now the, to search externally is turned in the other direction. You have to do that. <laughs> Siddhar Swami will condemn. Now they are looking externally for what should be sought internally. But now Jiva Goswami is shifting it in another direction. They consider even you as Paramatma. And they may look in, try to look inside. Okay, here's Paramatma. He said, no, you are not Paramatma. You are way beyond that. And they should look for you outside of there. They should look for you in Vrindavan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is, again, what Brahma is experiencing at the present moment. He is in Vrindavan. And he is, how to say, upgrading prospect to the point of identifying with the Brajavasi spirit. Brahma 
wants to be a Brajavasi. <laughs> He's realizing this is the place to look for you. Jiva Goswami concludes, in this way, the Atma, with capital A, or Krishna, should be soaked externally. Saying this, Jiva Goswami says, with his two index fingers, Brahma points to the two lotus feet of Krishna. <laughs> so Jiva Goswami adds this graphical depiction. No? So here it is said, one should search externally. Brahma is there, no? pointing with one finger to one feet, the other finger, index finger, fingers to Krishna's lotus feet. That's the lotus I, I was looking for, actually. So much that. No? That's the real stem of the lotus I had to, to search for. And Brahma implies, if that were not so, I would have remained meditating on you in my mind in Brahma Lok, and I will not have come here to Vrindavan again. Remember, Brahma is in Brahma Lok, generally absorbed in meditation, but now he's, he put his head on the ground. Remember, the devas do not touch the earth. That's part of their deva standard. No, do not inter intermingle, you say, mix with the earthlings. <laughs> no. But they just remain on some cautious distance. No? <laughs> but here Brahma has like thrown threw himself from the from his swan and put his head on the Brajaraj. So he's just realizing this point. I was looking and meditating on you in Brahma Lok and finding something, but now I'm realizing where which was the place that I should have looked for you. So it's here in Braj. Mm. Jiva Goswami concludes saying in this verse. Brahma praises those who give up everything, although they know Jiva Tattva and Ishvara Tattva, or the truth about the soul and, and the Supreme. But they'll give up everything and look for Krishna only in Vrindavan. So Brahma is, again, becoming fanatical for the Brajavasis. <laughs> no. You have to give up everything and come to Braj. Which, of course, Braj is not just buying a plane ticket and physically residing there, as Guruma said the other day. It's a, a, an internal uh, abode, if you will. Because you can have the ticket there and you can be physically in Vrindavan, but mentally in, I don't know, in Loi Bazaar, which is still Vrindavan, but... <laughs> <laughs> Or, or way beyond, way worse than that, of course. Louis Bazaar is still Vrindavan, but sometimes you are physically Vrindavan and mentally, who knows where. So, of course, in that case, it's way better to be out, physically outside of Vrindavan, but mentally in Vrindavan. So here, Brahma is emphasizing, you have to look for Krishna in Vrindavan. You have to give everything and go to Vrindavan. In other words, you have to follow the footsteps of the Brajavasi. That means go to Vrindavan. That means... Raganuga Bhakti. Raganuga Bhakti basically means Anuga, Raga, Anuga. Anuga means to follow in the footsteps of those who have the Raga or the Ragatmikas, <coughs> paradigmatic figures that embody a type of love that one wants to attain. So Brahma is making this point now. He has such a clear picture of his deity now. Okay, you are my Istade, Braja Krishna. I want to search for you in Vrindavan, not even in Mathura, not even in Dwarka, because there are so many Krishnas you know, in so many places. Mm -hmm. But the Raga Nuga ideal is Braj. Mm -hmm. Brahma is not interested in, even in Krishna out, outside of Braj, anywhere. In Dwarka, Mathura, as, as, that's the Brajavasi standard, basically. Even if Krishna is inviting you, come with me to Dwarka, I make you a princess there, I give you a palace, a castle, <laughs> or whatever. Oh, Rajavasi is like, no, you, like, like the gopis in Kurukshetra, like we were speaking in, in Finland, I think, for Rathi Yatra. No? Krishna is meeting the gopis and say, you can come with me to Dwarka. And the gopis are like, what? No. <laughs> the only thing that, that could solve the whole dilemma is if you put those feet back in Braj. That, that's, the, that's the only solution. There's no option apart from that. Hmm. We are all interested in Braja Krishna. Here it's not Braja Krishna. Krishna says, no, here, here I am. Where's your flute? Oh, well, no, I don't have flute here. Why? Because Krishna is not so inspired outside of Vrindavan. So he doesn't play flute. As Maharaj was telling today, he plays flute. But he plays flute because he's, he has a particular inspiration. When he goes out of Braj, 
he's inspired, of course. They are the boats in Mathura and Dwarka. We love them. They have Prem. <laughs> Ecstatically, we may say some other things, like some dear good brothers of mine sometimes express, but but he's not that inspired us to play the flute outside of Vrindavan. So he doesn't have the flute. So when they go, certainly, where is your flute? Where is your peacock feather? Where is your pitambra? Where is this? So Braja Krishna is not there. And that's not our deity. It says by Srinath Chakravarti. Our worshipful Bhagavan is Brajesatanayas. Braja Ishatanaya, the son of the king of Braj, Nanda Nandan Krishna. That's our Istadev, not again the son of Basudev or whatever, with all respect with all those manifestations. So Brahma again is feeling himself I part of the Rajabasi team now. I feel like them, I empathize with them, I do not care for even any other forms of Krishna. So he's getting closer and closer to his ideal. That's fine. <laughs> no? There are so many prayers like that. If you study some of the prayers of San Raguna Dasko Swami Manasik or some other place, he will say also, like, be careful with worshiping Lakshmi. No? You may be thrown to Vaikuntha. <coughs> be careful with these type of things. And just that, try to make your focus more and more exclusive. Mm -hmm. And so on. Mm -hmm. He will say, I'm worshiping Radha. And if someone is telling me that, that Krishna is in Dwarka and is inviting me to go there. I won't, I won't go there. I don't have anything to do there. He said, but if Radha in, in a fit of madness just runs after Krishna in Dwarka, I will go to Dwarka. Because my Swami is going there. So, so that's the way. <laughs> that's how gradually we should develop our devotional affinity. You know, there's, there's a type of bias. There's a type of... Uh, <laughs> Like Guru Maharaj today, you know, he was speaking today about Sakya. <laughs> and I really appreciated that because he was presenting his point of view. And I'm sure if someone with an affinity towards Madhurya Ras will hear that. Of course, they will appreciate that, but they will they could make their same presentation all in favor of Madhurya Bhav. <laughs> you follow my point. And there's place for that. And that's charming equally. But there's place to hear someone speaking about Sakya. And it seems that that's the top mode thing, and everything else is dependent on that. And, 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 and <laughs> here on earth, Ingolok, everything is revolving around that. That's like, okay. Some may think that sounds kind of fanatical. <laughs> but again, it's the type of fanaticism that comes in someone like Prabodhananda Saras, or someone who is there, basically. You know? So they are speaking from, from another side. There is a bias, but out of <laughs> power. <you know>? So. <laughs> So that's charming. I mean, the, the bias that comes out of bhava, that's charming. The bhava that comes out of absence of bhava, oh. <laughs> the first oh, not the second one. <laughs> Anyhow, let's go to Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's almost to conclude. Brahma prayed. He paraphrases Brahma. Now comes the smashing of Vibhartabhat. No, we cannot miss that part. Those who think they are knowledgeable of spiritual things, but actually are not, do not respect your transcendental form in Braj. As previously mentioned in verse 4, such persons are simply beating empty husks. A famous verse in the Brahma Stuti, which basically is a smashing of jnana. Those who only endeavor for jnana and, and do not take to bhakti and do not take specifically to jnana, sonya bhakti, which Brahma establishes, Gyan, Prayasa, Mudapas, and Amanta. They're, they're, they're useless, and they're, they, the only thing that gains, Sanatana Goswami says, is like a big sword, hands, and pain by empty by beating empty husks of rice. It's not that they don't gain anything, they gain something. Sore, sore hands and big headache, that's their gain. <laughs> so, Gaudias are very expert in smashing this type of possibilities. Although he, Vishwanath continues paraphrasing Brahma, although you are the soul with capital S, the Atma with capital A, people think that you in your personal form are some other soul with small s. That is, some variegated aspect of Maya separate from Paramatma. And so they think that the search for the soul must keep going outwardly. 
So he returns to that particular understanding of the search outwardly. This means they think that Paramatma must be sought outside of you. He makes this point now. Okay, you're looking for Paramatma. Okay, here you have Paramatma in every single sense of the term. The real meaning of Parama, Atma with capital A. Hmm? Brahma concludes, oh, again, oh, the ignorance of those people is utterly amazing. Hmm? So yeah, of course we can join Brahma and say, yes, the ignorance of that people is utterly amazing, but also we should say, Vidnara Lila of Sri Krishna is utterly amazingly, is amazingly perplexing also <laughs> for many. No, and it's easy to, to misread and to think this is ordinary. You fall. Bra Bra Brahma is having an epiphany now and saying, how could possibly someone think that you are ordinary? But five minutes ago, he thought that. <laughs> you fall. So he's also making this point. This Nara Lila is so high, but also he's making the point, it's easy to misunderstand. So therefore, of course, you have to pay close attention. That's going to well, say Nityam Bhagavat, Siva, yeah. You have to render Siva to the Bhagavat, which very one-pointed focus and attention. Because if not, you can miss the whole point and think this Krishna is one, one of us. And we can just do what he's doing. We can imitate. We can organize. Rasa Lila on the other side, on the other side of the street or whatever. <laughs> And that has happened. So, <laughs> so Nara Lila is it potentially really, as Kuraj was explaining today, it's, it's a, very nicely he said, you know, this idea of, okay, we are humans, Krishna is divine. You know, for the two to get closer, the, the divine has to become human and the human have to become divine to, to reach some in-between meeting point. Because if not, it's, it's, it's too overwhelming of a gap between the two. But you have to be careful that in the context of doing that, of course, Krishna becomes a human. And if you don't become divine, you will think, oh, he's a human like me. <laughs> so you have to become divine to understand Krishna's becoming human. Because if, if you don't do your homework of divinizing your humanity, you will just think, oh, this Krishna is one of us. But not in a charming way like the Rajavasi thing. Because the Rajavasi is saying, oh, he's one of us. But they are divine <laughs> to follow the point. No? So, so this this caution is shared here, and not only shared here, but over and over again. Braja Lila is a very delicate reality. So and Brahma is the main example of that, the mo most intelligent person in the whole universe. He was not able to understand Braja Lila. And he wanted to enter Braja Lila, but he didn't understand the implications of the Braja Lila. So we have to be careful because we officially are Gaudiya Vaishnavas and we officially want to enter Braja Lila. But we may not have played out all the that all, all that implies to be in Braja Lila. And and maybe if we if we if we were shown a trailer of that as Brahma received, it may be too much. Or we may misread some parts of that. Because maybe we have not fully done our homework of divinizing our side. <laughs> The following point. So Brahma is showing that. He wanted that. He said, I want Sakya. Krishna shook hands with me, beginning of creation. Oh, I want that. But when Krishna said, okay, here is Sakya. <laughs> he threw Brahma on the picnic. And Brahma was like, what was this? <laughs> this is not... I don't want this, basically. He didn't feel I'm attracted to that. He said, this is ordinary. But actually, Brahma was still ordinary on some level. Such an extraordinary being still needed to go through some layers of <laughs> further divinizing himself. Then in his purport, Bishwanath Chakravarti Thakur will quote long list of verses. I won't share them now. It would be too much. But many verses showing how Krishna's form, Braja Lila, Nara Lila, Krishna's Nara Rupa form, human-like form, is actually a fully spiritual form, basically. And he concludes saying, after all this list of verses, igno ignoring this, ignoring, sorry, these scriptural statements, the ones he quoted, that show how Brahman, in this case the Absolute, has a body and exists in a spiritual abode, Dham, people remain in darkness, ignoring this idea of, Jiva Goswami will say, Narakriti Brahman, Brahman in 
human form. Ignoring that Brahman, the Absolute, has a spiritual form, has an abode, they remain in darkness. They are so fallen, now comes the final smashing to update about again. They are so fallen by accepting a blind Guru Parampara and discussing Vivartavad. They are in the most lamentable of all lamentable conditions in my creation. And Brahma himself is thinking, in my whole creation, there is nothing more lamentable than that. This is the main smashing of the verse to us, Abhaitabad, which basically consider Krishna's form is Anupadi, basically, which is like a limiting adjunct, like superficial designation. It's not permanent, it's not transcendental. What to say? What to say? This is the ultimate form of all forms. It's something to be transcended eventually. So if you play out the implications of that, you can understand a little bit more how some, why sometimes the Gaudias speak <laughs> intensely about this particular proposal. <clears throat> Let's conclude with Srinivas Suri. He says, similarly, he follows what Jiva Goswami said. He said, he paraphrases Brahm in a similar line saying, even after realizing that you are Paramatma and that you are the eminent Atma with capital A without any upadi, they still think that Brahman, the spirit which is Nirvishesh and Nirgun, is to be sought outside of you. Oh, how silly of them. So some of you even, they may realize, okay, you are Paramatma, etc., etc., but when they think of Brahman, the Absolute, they are attached to that idea of the Absolute and they do not understand that you are the very foundation of Brahman. Hmm? Brahma, what would say Bhagavad Gita? Brahma, Buddha, Prashtana, no. Brahma, no, he preaches down, thank you. Hmm? So Krishna himself is saying, I am the foundation of Brahman. Hmm? Hmm. And, and, Brahma will, and Brahma will say that in a few verses again, Purna Brahma Sanatanam. And you are the complete face of Brahman as, as the absolute, as Guru Master these days also emphasize. Hmm? Like when he mentioned the root, the datu of Brahman is brim, and brim means like to grow or to expand. Hmm? So that's in connection to Brahman. And, and I think Jiva Goswami quotes in one of his purpose here, the very derivation of Brahman. He said, Brihatvat brim hanatvat chat chat smat uchati param Brahman from Vishnu Purana. Para Brahman is so called because it is huge and because it increases. <laughs> so again, this idea of you are eternal, permanent, increasing. <laughs> so here Brahma is gradually, if you pay attention, Brahma, Brahma is building his case for establishing Krishna as this Purna Brahma Sanatanam. He will say that in five verses. You are the full face of Brahman and Brahma means to grow, to expand. That's Krishna, Brahman possess of Shakti, Brahman possess of Achintya Shakti, basically. <clears throat> you are not ordinary, basically. You are, I mean, as we were speaking today, this idea of para Brahma ultimately applies to Krishna. If you say Brahma is growing and expanding, that's Braja Krishna. He has medium sized form, but it's all pervading. That was Brahma made in many verses before. You're all pervading medium-sized form. <laughs> Try to put the two together. No? You have a medium-sized form, which is all pervading. It's like, it's not computing in the logic department. And that's the idea, no? that yes, Bhaga, the Brahman, the Absolute, Parascha Shakti Vividhaiva Shruyate, the Absolute is possessed of Shaktis. And one of those Shaktis is Achintya Shakti. We don't want to cheaply press the chintya button, as we were being joking these days. No, this is comic of Guru Nishta. <laughs> I don't know if you saw it. If not, you have to. And that someone is asking some complicated question in class, and the speaker doesn't have a clue what to say, and is like sweating like nothing. Well, he's performing a self Abhishek while sweating. <laughs> And he has on one side one button that says Achintya. No? And he's like ready to press the button. And maybe maybe the Vyasasana will like shoo, disappear. And I don't have to deal with these complex issues anymore. So the, so the Achintya button is not to be pressed cheaply. 
but it's to be pressed. It's there. It's there in the in the keyboard. No? So it, there is place to say there are some things which are achintya. But achintya doesn't mean, I mean, the, the, the Bhagavan has achintya shakti or inconceivable potencies that can do something that is beyond our comprehension. I mean, what's the problem with that? The problem is that it's beyond my comprehension generally. And I would like to grasp everything in the face of my intellect. intellect. Hmm. So the, the fact that Bhagavan has a chintya shakti, and this has been really emphasized during this last verse, actually it's totally mandatory. Bhagavan has to have a chintya shakti. Bhagavan has not a chintya shakti. What's the meaning of that? God can be understood by logic. And, and that, that shouldn't happen. If you can understand God by logic, how much God is God, basically. <laughs> No, God can be understood by the reach of my limited material experience. It's not possible. So he has a chinta shakti. He has he presents an array of energies that are way beyond our capacity, but nonetheless can be understood not by our logic, by our mundane experience, by going to shastra, by going to revelation. That's how God Himself, in the words of Guru Maharaj, shastra is God's extending Himself to us, revealing Himself to us. So we can understand him in a way that we couldn't otherwise. And that's what Vedanta says, Shastra Juni Tuat. Shastra is the womb through which knowledge about Brahman, the Absolute, is coming. Shaptis to Molev, how what was that? Shabdi Moles to Shabdi. Shabdi Moles to something. It's the same as Shastra Juni Tuat, basically. <laughs> no? Shastra or, or Sabda, divine sound is is the root through which you can know about Bhagavan. Without that, Krishna himself saying the Gita, Jasya Strevidi Mutriya Bhartati Kama Karata Asasidim Nasasidim Abhapnati Nasukam Naparam Gatim. If you neglect Shastra and nonetheless you try to engage or even approach me in a whimsical way, Nasasidim Abhapnati Nasukam Naparam Gatim. There is no perfection, there is no happiness, there is no ultimate goal. So what, what is there <laughs> is the question. <laughs> So this point is made over and over again. So we can press the chintya button in a legal way in this moment here <laughs> and conclude our narration at this point. And in the next verse, Brahma will conclude this particular section of prayers inside the Brahma Stuti before he will turn almost to the last section of the Brahma Stuti where he will turn even more emotional and he will start to say, aho, more than once. <laughs> And will start to express very deeply his his longing to enter the the Brajabab, basically. But that yeah, that will we continue in our next lecture, which will be in Switzerland. So see you there. <laughs> in case we are not that far, so just in case. And thank you so much for allowing me these days to render some seva to Harikata. And I don't know if there are any questions before finishing, before we conclude some commentaries. Say so anything. <clears throat> Thanks. So um, I was wondering about um, Brahma is addressing Advaita Vada, but uh, Shankara is uh, Advaita Vada is kind of formulated in, in the Middle Ages, right? Shankara came in the Middle Ages, so mm -hmm. so how can Brahma uh, address Advaita Vada? This is one part of the question. And also, uh, if you could say something, because uh, the Chaitanya tree is sometimes mentioned to have like roots, like the Shankara school has uh, is, is kind of um, the, sometimes described to be the ro roots of that tree, like many of the, or uh, Sri yes. Swami. The Shankara school to be the root yeah, of like the tree Yeah, like Sri Swami and other... I've heard that anal analogy that they they are actually uh, kind of supporting with the like in an, giving a negative impetus, let's say, in the debates that they offer. Mm -hmm. So, like uh, for example, Buddhism also kind of the, there is a theological evolution, uh, kind of. Mm -hmm. So, like uh, if we can kind of discover, if we can discover. In Buddhism and in Advaita philosophy, how they have like negatively contributed 
mm-hmm. or have they? Perhaps that's a question. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Have they somehow <clears throat> in their uh, like negative impetus, like um, because like the Hindu climate has kind of changed since Buddha came, like mm-hmm. pre-Buddhism, Hindu, Hinduism look different in a way like um and uh, also i mean um shankara has also kind of changed the uh, the hindu climate and all pre mm-hmm. pre chitanya mahapra mm-hmm. maybe you can say some words so. okay so the first part is how could brahma know about advaita vedanta since shankaracharya came at the moment which chronologically is after Speaking of Brahma Vimohan Lila, well, we could say some different things in that connection. First thing I will say is that the main smashing of Advaita Vedanta is not coming so much directly by Brahma, but the commentators, no? which will read the verse in a way to smash Advaita Vedanta. <laughs> and of course, the commentators are all of them. Uh, chronologically appearing after Sankaracharya, because mostly are our Goswamis, the ones who mostly have smashed Advaita Vedanta. Sridhar Swami, as we know in his commentary, not only he does not smash Advaita Vedanta, but sometimes he speaks of it, Advaita Vedanta, as a, we will say, at least. <laughs> of course, some other people will think he was an Advaita body in total, but actually we'll say that was a, there was, I don't remember the, Sag term of the Nyaya, which is Bada, Bada, Misa, Nyaya. No, there is like this, like the bait, not the bait, but bait that you put give to the fish to catch the fish. So there's a type of Nyaya or a maxim, like you put some bait to catch the fish. So you speak about something, but actually to catch the attention of some people and give them something else. Not Bhagavatam gives the example of the father's parents keep putting sweet in the medicine and giving the kids, okay, have a, have a gulab jamun. No, you're taking an ibuprofen or something there. <laughs> so so I would say mostly in that connection, it, it's not so much about what Brahma is saying, but um, but what the Goswamis are saying, but also one could say that, of course, the, the notion of Advaita Vedanta, all those Sankaracharya somehow officialized it. That's, that's a conception that... I mean, that's a possibility that exists eternally. I mean, you can obtain Brahma Suyuja. It's not that before Sankaracharya, that was not available. No, I mean, that was available. So in one sense, you can say that's an eternal possibility. So, of course, there are two types of that. We already spoke in the previous time. There, was, there are those who who acknowledge Bhagavan, do not offend Bhakti, and they are the ones who obtain Brahma Suyuja. And there are those who Considering the form, consider the form of Bhagavan illusory, and they, for us, won't attain that goal. So that's another thing. So that's the first part, and the second part, when we were, you were saying that the the, the tree of Mahaprabhu is rooted in in Advaita Vedanta. I'm not so sure if I. Or, or uh, my, yeah, my point is that maybe you refer, maybe not, but sometimes they say that this, like. Um, metaphorical root is root is rooted metaphorical tree is rooted in, in, in certain sannyasi that were accompanying Mahaprabhu. And mostly all of them had a background of Advaita Vedanta, although that's not the same as to say the root of Mahaprabhu's tree is rooted in Advaita Vedanta. Yeah. But <laughs> so if we take it in that direction, the idea mainly is in that connection is this root, this tree, sorry, of bhakti is rooted in vairagya, like like meaning. There, this is not an, an, a mere sentimentalism, a mere emotional thing, which was, of course, something that Mahaprabhu was criticized for by Advaita Vadis. You know? Like you are dancing and singing, you are like just an emotionalist. But there was there was a deep corresponding renunciation coming out of as a byproduct of his bhakti you know, and, and, and from his followers as well. And Mahaprabhu was, was really pleased with that. Mahaprabhu bhakta ganer bhaira gya pradam yaha deki krish pritahai gauda bhagavam. Say Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami. So Mahaprabhu bhakta ganer 
vairagya pradhan one of the main or the main is attribute of the gan the group the followers of mahaprabhu is vairagya ya deki prita hoy gaura bhagavan and when gaura bhagavan is seeing that renunciation oh he becomes so pleased <laughs> But again, he's not here promoting all of you accept sannyas and go to the forest and all you fall into the dark well of family life and this type of things. <laughs> We are not saying that no? because to begin with, family life shouldn't be a dark well, just in case. <laughs> It can be, but sannyas ashram can be a dark well as well <laughs> if you don't properly understand that it's an ashram. An ashram means potential for shelter. So, but the point is, all this renunciation is the renunciation that comes as comes as a byproduct of bhakti. Basudevi bhagavati bhakti yoga prayojita janaya tiasu vairagyam janam chaya the high to come. Bhagavatam says by culturing of Basudev bhakti comes knowledge and renunciation. So, so like implying that's at the root of the tree. It's not just a mere emotional. Fruit that is coming is deeply rooted in, although it seems mundane, it's deeply rooted in indifference to the spirit of exploitation. So that on that on that other side, and in connection to to schools like Buddha, Buddhism, and, and, and Advaita Vedanta offering negative impetus. <laughs> well, of course, if you are expert to To, to draw that, you will find that everywhere. I mean, you will find Udipanas, if you want to use the term a little bit more loosely, everywhere. No, whether directly or indirectly, everything will be an Udipana. Everything will be providing positive or negative impetus regarding one thing or the other. Um, for us in our particular time and situation, I will say that and Gurumash. I know he agrees. No, it's not so much like let's smash all these Maya bodies and send them to hell through our preaching and show how demon they are and blah blah blah. I, 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 we may not see that well to others, and even how much is it? How much we are dealing with that ourselves? No, so you can you can learn from them to begin with, <laughs> as Guru Maharaj will say when when Srila Prabhupada gave sannyas to Guru Maharaj. The other day, Guru Maharaj was speaking that took place in Baladev in Rasa Purnima in, in Brindao in 1975. And he gave sannyas and, and he told something like, if you see a, a Maya Bhadi sannyasi, you should offer Dandabha, Dandabha to him, his sannyasi. And maybe five minutes ago in the class, he was like throwing Sudarshan to all the Beta Bhadis. <laughs> So you have to understand the word of the acharyas, no? Because if you get only one part, since if I see a Mayavad sannyasi, well, now I have a, a reason to use my danda. No, like, well, no, because the danda not only means chastisement, but the danda has one part. Maybe you never see it because it's generally covered by cloth, but it's one part like this, who's who seems like a how do you call it? <laughs> <laughs> guillotine or something <laughs> it's called prasa prasa which is kind of an i mean yeah <laughs> a chopping weapon or something uh, so to, to cut misconception of course that's the idea no? cut misconception it's, it's not that this actually something that you can cut people it's made of bamboo so you, it's not that you do like this with the bamboo and you're about to behead someone or something But you can misread, okay, now I have this weapon in my hand. I'm ready to cut misconception. There comes an Advaita Vadin. He's a sannyasi, so you are like pointing. <laughs> I probably say, offer pranam to him. And you're like, what problem? Why you to give me this danda for then? <laughs> I thought it was for smashing other people. I said, no, 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 no. You offer pranam to everyone else and you smash yourself, basically. You got all misconceptions in yourself, so. So I would say that's a way more healthy approach to other traditions with even overtly pr proposed nihil nihilism or monism, which somehow doesn't fit with our eternal prospect. And, and, and yeah, but contrast, you can, they, can, they are sh shedding more light on the rich and wealth 
of, of the Gaudia conclusion. So you may be grateful to for them to for creating that contrasting example that by comparison you realize well, you, you become humble and increase your appreciation for the ideal that has knocked on your door and you're grateful to all others who will create that not opposition but contrasting experience that helps you to to further appreciate the, the nature of your of our ideals and something like that we could say more but I don't know something else Krishna Karanam Prabhu uh, we have this conception of uh, Achintya Shakti and uh, uh, Advaita Vadis have this uh, they call uh, Shakti of uh, Bhagavan as a Anirvachaniya, hmm. that you cannot say even if it exists or not exists. Mm -hmm. So could you please clarify if they using this uh, term Anirvachaniya because they don't know if uh, Shakti exists or not, or there is some third category beside, beside the Sat or Asat hmm. <laughs> existing and not existing. Yeah, that's. I cannot. I cannot understand this. <laughs> Sanirbachaniya. They have their own bats on there. <laughs> yeah, with Anirbachaniya, they mostly refer to a category between sad and asad, basically. You know, and going with this example again with the rope and the snake, they will. They will try it because I mean it's a complex and long discussion. But basically, for example, you will say to them. Okay, the only thing, Brahma Satya Jagan Mitya, only Brahman is real, everything is illusory. So you may say, okay, but now why, why I, I, who I'm supposed to, I'm, I'm Brahman according to your philosophy, I'm the absolute, why I'm not aware of that? And they will say, well, that's because of Maya. And you may say, but how come Maya cover, I'm, I'm Brahman, supposedly according to them. I'm the absolute. How can Brahma be covered by, by Maya? And where is Maya coming from if only Brahman is real? <laughs> and not only something else is coming, but it's covering. No? You follow my book. So if only Brahman is real. Everything else is false. Okay, why am I not realizing that? Because of Maya. But just say that only Brahman is real. <laughs> no, no, but Maya. But, and Maya is covering Brahman. So how that's happening then? Anirbhajaniya, which it means impossible to explain, unexplicable or something like that. No, so they will say Maya is real and it's not real at the same time. And they, anyhow, we don't want to end in saying it's a whole play of words and things like that. But if you really play out the whole things, and as our Goswami have did, if you study Tattva Sandarbha, Jiva Goswami, and some other, they they destroy these arguments from tip to toe. Of course, they. They have their good arguments. It's not that they only say Anirbachani and end of the discussion. I mean, probably if many of us have a debate with the Nadbeita body, we may be we may not know what to say at some point. <laughs> also, I'm saying that because sometimes we think, ah, well, in five minutes I will <laughs> not necessarily. <laughs> so if you go through how Jigo Goswami deals with that, that's very interesting. He himself invokes further arguments. From that bait about side, incredible arguments that maybe even themselves are not involved presenting to support their own their <laughs> theory. But I, I will, of course, we will, we we can. They or someone may make a parallel. Okay, you have a chintya, we have anirbhachaniya, but it's not exactly the same thing, mm -hmm. technically speaking. This is a different. Again, for us, a chintya doesn't mean we cannot explain that. There is no way to say anything about that. But it's basically. And this is what Jiva Goswami mentions in the Sarva Sambhalini commentary to Paramatma Sandarva, Shastraika, Tarkalabhyam, and some words I'm missing at the moment. Basically saying, Atinti means that something remains inconceivable unless and until you turn to Shastra. Period. Atinti doesn't mean it, it, it is inconceivable. It's only inconceivable if you don't turn to Shastra. If you turn to Shastra with proper faith in Shastra, of course, Shastra is Radha, everything will be conceivable because Shastra will be speaking beyond your the, the reach of your logic. Well, Anirvachaniya is not so much something that points in, into that same direction. 
yeah, it's I will say with all respect, it's more like an emergency button or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, for, for seeing more details on how this theory is presented and also I will go the arguments to that, I will recommend you can go through. I mean the whole Sandarvas are dealing with that in different parts, but that the Sandarvas especially establishing that right at the very beginning. Okay. Well, okay, we are almost in time for for Arctic. So in ten minutes, so I think we can stop here in case someone needs to do something before that. Srila Guru Dev ki jai, Sri Man Mahaprabhu ki jai, Sri Hari Nam Sankirtan ki jai, Sri Sri Gornitanand ki jai, Dantara Sri Mad Bhagavatan ki jai, Sri Brahma Stuti ki jai, Gaur Bhakta Bind ki jai, Gaur Pramanand Hari Go. One chakal patarubya shakri pas and dubya eva cha pati tanam pavane pure vishna vipyanamon mahananta koti vishna brindaki jai go to haribo.